Good morning. Welcome to GIA part one, also deploy in force. I'm Evgeny. Uh, I'm from Berlin and not surprisingly going by the name of CJ Berlin on Twitter and some other online communities. So if you have any further question after the conference, please hit me up there. Are you guys liking the show? Are you guys liking the show? Thank you very much. So, uh, the whole plan here is not to look at JIA from the security standpoint, because JIA as a security feature is not a hard sell at all. It has been around for like uh, since uh, 2014. I think in April 2014, Jeffrey uh, held his first, pre first presentation about JIA publicly, and since then, we are trying to persuade folks to implement that and run that in their environments with limited success so far, but that's what we are hoping to change here. So we look at GIA not from the security perspective, but from the operations perspective, because that's where the most challenges lie. GIA is pretty much complex, that's why it's so difficult to hold a really awesome presentation about GIA in 45 minutes. GIA is about limiting very much more than enabling so that it's more of this operational stuff. Then we'll look at concepts. I've come up uh, in the course of the years that help overcome those operational limitations. I'll demo bits and pieces of a tool set I've made to enable organization to do that, and we'll look, if time permits, at the limitations uh, of those. The problem with security tech in general, or at least that's what I perceive. I've been in this industry for 30 years, and that I've seen that over and over again. If a vendor decides to embed a great security feature into an underlying product, there's usually next to nothing in terms of managing it, in terms of operating it. Think AppLocker. How do you manage AppLocker? Not much there out of the box. Windows Defender, application control, even less. Windows Defender, great product, great, great technology, but nothing to manage it with unless you've got SCCM. BitLocker, same story. JIT. You have all the bits and pieces at hand if you are on Active Directory uh, function level 2016 or, uh, or better to have JIT, but next to nothing to manage it besides PowerShell commandlets. And if you have some LDAP foo, you can do that with uh, directory services classes. Or you go get MIM, which of course has a very steep uh, price tag. DSC. Great technology, but the community has had to step in in order to make that operational. And now GIA, exactly the same story. Because if you try to do GIA at scale, you end up editing copies and mounts of flat text files and running hundreds and thousands of commands against some machines. We are at a scripting conference here, so those could seem like a natural thing to do. But for the guys, again, it's a security technology, it's a compliance technology. For the guys who have to report to the higher-ups on security and compliance, they do not need to know if the web designer who started her job yesterday can access, uh, remove net LBFO 
group member on her web server or not. That's, that's not what it's about. Those guys and girls, they need dashboards. They need, need reports. They need like a state of the infrastructure. We have deployed Jira. How far did the deployment go? Do the machine conform to what we have deployed? Do the machine conform to what we have extended, uh, intended? Sorry. So the questions that you need to answer are at the first glance completely different from what we scripting people do. You should start with the main reason why do you uh, deploy Jira in the first place. That helps overcome some limitations. How does, how does that uh, business driver translate to Jira delivery model? Jira delivery model is not a standard Microsoft term, but I will be using it a lot in this and the next talk. So uh, I'll, I'll come to that in a minute. How do I reuse configuration? How can I keep a track of my deployment? How can, I, how can I keep track of changes? And then, from the compliance people, the question of all questions, what rights does the user X have on machine Y in terms of Jira? Right? So there's another uh, thing that uh, is a problem with Jira, but um, I cannot help you much with that. Those of you who has attended the excellent session of Paul uh, Higginbotham yesterday have heard it from the horse's mouth. Constraint endpoints, which are at the heart of Jira, are a feature uh, of WinRM remoting. So. If you do that fancy stuff uh, like remoting from Mac to Linux over SSH, you're not going to get Jira into that anytime soon. If, you do, if you're doing the less fancy stuff of remoting into a Windows box but using SSH, you're not going to get Jira even there. Even though it may have been deployed for the WinRM remoting on that same box. If you open SSH on that, you can bypass Jira completely. So now, before we start into the conceptual uh, part, let's have a quick show of hands. Is there a person in this room who does not have a basic understanding of how Jira actually works, of what it is? Okay, a couple. Two sentences. You can remote to a machine, and for the sake of this talk, let's say you can remote from one Windows machine to another Windows machine using PowerShell. And with Jira, you can define the remoting configuration on the target end so that the, in that remoting session, only certain commandlets, and of those, only certain parameters can be basically seen and used by the invoker. That's part one. That's the limiting part. Part two is the enabling part. I mean, there's more to that. I'm simplifying. But those are the basic two features. The lim limiting part is, is I can describe what commandlets, parameters, and even values for those parameters the user can see in her Jira session, and the enabling part is, once she files off a valid command within that session, I can configure it so that it gets executed with God rights, or with whatever rights are necessary uh, to, to execute that command uh, against those systems without giving that user appropriate permission to do so directly. Okay, so limiting part, enabling part. And there's uh, some more to this. Okay. Before we, uh, before we start into the Jira delivery modeling, let's, uh, let's look at how Jira invocation works under the hood. 
Gia introduced the, or Gia utilizes the concept of endpoints, which are configurations. In the whole commandlet, you, you will see this parameter configuration name. I will use, uh, I will use uh, configuration and endpoint for the sake of this talks interchangeable. Um, so an invoker connects to a machine using a certain endpoint of configuration. If you don't specify anything here, you're connecting to Microsoft.PowerShell. That's the default endpoint that exists on every uh, Windows machine with PowerShell installed, with PowerShell 2 or better installed. But uh, hopefully nobody has PowerShell 1 in production because I, I, I cannot, uh, cannot help you guys then. So, we're connecting to a certain endpoint. Here uh, in this picture, there are two of them, orange and magenta. And uh, we have whatever modules we, we have installed in that machine, they export commandlets. There is a red commandlet, a green commandlet, or, and a couple of blue commandlets. So now we have connected and successfully authenticated to the orange endpoint. GIA evaluates, or WinRM remoting evaluates the group memberships of that user and maps them to role capabilities that are defined in the endpoint. So the membership in the red group gives the user access to the red role, and the membership in the green group gives, gives the user access to the green role. Fancy stuff. In the next step, the role capabilities define uh, which commandlets, parameters, validators, etc. Uh, are accessible to the invoker in this session. And this is where it gets, it gets interesting. So unsurprisingly, we have access to, to the uh, red uh, commandlets. The, uh, the colors kind of su suggested that. We have access to the second red commandlet. And through the green role, we have access to the green commandlet, big surprise, and to the red commandlet also, which is where it, get, where it gets really interesting, which is uh, where we need to uh, stop a little and try to understand what happens. If we just present the two commandlets in the role, it, it, it's called visible commandlets or visible functions uh, in the role definition file. So if if uh, there's just the name of the commandlet in both roles, nothing fancy happens, it will be accessible to the user. If different sets of parameters are defined in these uh, green and red uh, roles, or different validators, they will be superposed in the most lenient way. So it's kind of like uh, file permissions when we forget about deny. Everything that's allowed somewhere gets added up, and that's the resulting set of GIA that we get. There are situations where one custom validator can get completely ignored if they are for, uh, of different types, etc. What are these role capabilities? Where do they live? Those are flat text files. That is nothing fancy or encrypted registry blobs or whatever. Those are flat text files. They are, have the extension .psrc and live in the role capabilities subfolder of some module that's uh, uh, installed on the machine which is, that is, uh, within one of the PS module paths. The module does not have to export any commandlets actually used in the role, but you need a module in order to make those roles accessible to GS. So flat text files in known, basically in known paths or in subfolders of uh, some known paths. Okay, there we go. Now the user decided to connect to the magenta endpoint. 
what happens here. The user is uh, in, the, in the green group, but the magenta endpoint is defined in a way that gives her access to the blue role, although she's a member of the green groups. I can define it freely in the uh, endpoint configurations. And there also is a black role, which is assigned to the user personally, not through any group memberships. And these groups, these roles, give the user access to some commandlets, and surprisingly, the black role exposes a green commandlet, uh, although we uh, did not have defined the green role anywhere in here. So it's a simplified view at how uh, GIA invocation uh, actually uh, calculates the resulting set of GIA. And uh, with this knowledge, we can uh, jump on to the GIA delivery model. So basically, what you need to take away from this part GIA is a, always a user-to-machine relationship. It can be proxied through group memberships, it can be direct, but GIA is always a user connecting to an endpoint. It's a, it's a uh, conscious decision to connect to a certain endpoint. Role capabilities are flat text files that reside in known location. They can't be signed, by the way. Role superposition works in the most lenient way. There is no concept of deny. So you, can, you can't define anywhere, prohibit those commandlets. No matter what the user will be seeing or not, those commandlets should be invis invisible. And that was the first limitation uh, that I encountered uh, when trying to, to implement GIA in production for a larger uh, organization. They told me, uh, okay, design, uh, all well and good, but we need to make sure that certain things just don't get exposed. How do we do that? Okay. And there is only one run as account for every endpoint. So that account with possibly God rights or admin rights uh, that you um, enable your user to run commands as. It's not part of the role, it's part of the endpoint. So one connection to an endpoint defines which account uh, those, uh, those uh, commandlets will run under. Okay. So, uh, in my practice, I worked with three GIA delivery models. And I will not give a definition of what uh, a GIA delivery model is supposed to be, but I just show uh, all the three of them so you, you, will see, you will see what I mean by that. So the canonical GIA delivery, that's the way it's described in the docs. You have an endpoint, in that endpoint, you define all the fancy stuff, run as account, transcript folder, uh, language mode, etc. And then that endpoint translates to role definitions for a multitude of user and groups. Uh, those files uh, can grow quite large in, in the delivery model. So, uh, and, uh, and in, in, in the end, it gets uh, resolved to actual commandless uh, parameters and uh, value validators. So, this has, this has uh, a couple of upsides to it. You have only one endpoint, ideally, right? Uh, if, you, if you manage to design your GS so that you can only have one endpoint, right? You can have one endpoint per machine. Here, it can basically be uh, called server management or frog management or whatever you, you wish to call that. And the users who access that machine or any other machine within the GIA reach know, okay, 
I basically don't have rights to access the default endpoint. I need to go to the server management endpoint. Downsides to that. Role capability superposition can get very tricky, and you have no control about that uh, because the role assignments will follow group memberships. And the group memberships may well be outside of your control as the GM master. So somebody changes group memberships of a user, and she all of a sudden becomes or loses access to functionality that was there before or wasn't. Token lingering. Jia is a great feature for temporary temporary uh, consultants or temporary staff, but um, group memberships have been evaluated once at session setup and in uh, a uh, Active Directory infrastructure configured by default, the token lifetime in Kerberos is 10 hours, so even if you take the consultants out of those groups that uh, gave her access to Jira endpoints, she still could be able to use existing sessions for the remainder of the 10 hours or whatever. JIT can help here. That's why uh, everybody who's uh, basically talking about JIA also will be talking about JIT, because that's one great way to mitigate that. Uh, but uh, you, need, you need to have uh, tools in place to manage that as well. And as we with any role-based access control, users that have many responsibilities will inevitably end up belonging to hundreds of groups, which sometimes can lead to token bloat with all the consequences that are <clears throat> known. Role-centric geo delivery. This is what the canonical geo delivery would be on a one-trick pony machine. If, if a machine only has one person uh, purpose, I'm sorry, if the machine only has uh, one purpose, then the whole canonical endpoint configuration would be, in theory, dedicated to managing that purpose, that server role or subsystem or application or whatever. If we, uh, if we project that onto a machine that maybe has uh, multiple features installed, we could, tr we could try defining a separate endpoint per role or per feature. The downside, obviously, is the user that, who's connecting to that needs to know the name of the endpoint. It could be <clears throat> a great security by obscurity feature, by the way, uh, because those users who don't need uh, those endpoints may not know uh, how, how they are called, right? Uh, but where it gets really weird is when I need to access multiple endpoints within one session or within one script. So that takes getting used to. I will talk some about, uh, about this situation in my next talk, where we'll look at uh, GIA from the constrained administrator's perspective. But there's that. You need to remember names and you need to develop administrative <laughs> skills to work with multiple sessions within one script or one uh, PowerShell uh, session. Those configurations tend to be very straightforward uh, in terms of the flat files. And, uh, and, and commands that uh, need to be executed. Those configurations have one tremendous uptime, uh, up, uh, uptime that uh, you can have multiple, multiple um, runners accounts for every role that you have. And you have uh, more homogeneous uh, definitions of your uh, configurations, it basically would be uh, would have uh, 
restricted admin and full admin for each role, and that, that would, would be a typical, typical endpoint configuration. So the weirdest of all, but that has the most potential, actually, is the user-centric geo delivery, where you actually define a personal endpoint for each user on each machine. You're not going to have to, to want to manage that manually. In no way, right? But there are really, really big uptimes using that. First, you have no poten uh, potential of group membership lingering, drift, or bloat. You have zero change on config change. Because once a user endpoint is there, you're probably not going to change the endpoint configuration all that often. You will be changing the role capabilities. That's for sure. But those are flat text files. They are evaluated at session setup and only then. So you can replace, it, replace them as you go. They won't become active until the user disconnects and reconnects, but that's it. If you change endpoint configurations, which you would be doing if you uh, register new roles in, in, a, uh, in a standard endpoint or whatever, you need to restart WinRM before that beca becomes active. So you would probably not be wanting to do that in the working hours. So you need to, you need to uh, develop some strategy there. The other downtime is no separation of runtime accounts. Uh, so you can have users uh, without administrative rights using this uh, delivery model, but with the limitation that per machine, uh, all the actions this user will execute will have to be run in the context of one uh, run as account, right? So <clears throat> these are the three uh, three deployment models, GIA delivery models that uh, I've come up with doing GIA design, and now we need to translate those business guys into the copies amounts of uh, text files and scripts that have been run. For that, we need some kind of magic input-output machine. We need to do abstraction here so that we, have, uh, we can make business requirements and security requirements digestible by the input-output machine. Then we need to push out the resulting configurations in whatever way we choose to do that. And of course, once that's in place, remember, security and compliance guys love reports. They need reports before, because they need to answer to higher-ups. So we need some way to monitor and, um, uh, and uh, recertify this. Now, how, how, do we do, how do we do that? I mean, uh, exporting configurations, they are flat text files. There is nothing fan fancy about that. How do we do this? One approach I came up uh, with is like here. We split this role. I mean, the GIA limitations or what, what a GIA endpoint offers is contained in role capability files that get superposed. Now, you can split that uh, stuff into the machine part, which is basically specific, specific to a certain configuration on a certain machine, which will include which model, modules are required to 
do whatever this role needs to do. Which commandlets will this role uh, potentially offer? Which commandlets are required? And which commandlets are strictly disallowed for this machine role? If you, if you have, uh, if you have a machine that has long running tasks, you probably will want to disallow restart computer for everybody except for God. Custom functions. Those you can define at uh, multiple levels, but you can, you, you can uh, have multiple functions uh, in, in your configuration which are specific to that endpoint. And you can define them per role. Possible, possible run as account for this role. Not every account is suitable to do whatever this role needs to do, but there can be multiple. So I put all the possible run as accounts in there. External commands. You wouldn't be seeing any external commands in a JIRA, in, in a constrained JIRA endpoint. You can, like, uh, call ping, uh, dot exe or, uh, trace rt.exe in a constraint endpoint unless this command has been exposed by the uh, endpoint configuration. Possible transcript path. Transcript, most of you will have uh, attended the security talks about script logging and transcripting, etc. You can make transcripting, and you should make transcripting, compulsory within your GIA implementation. So, uh, but there could be multiple paths within one and the same machine where you can do that. So uh, we'll just list possible, uh, possible candidates. So if, if my machine doesn't have a Z drive, so Z dot PS transcript is not a good candidate. But if it, if it has C, D and M, then I could list all, all of those there. And uh, PS drives that is, are required for the role. For the users or groups, you make a much, uh, much lighter user role configurations, which basically lists what this user what a printer administrator, when she accesses a print server, should expect to find in terms of commandlets, uh, functions, and modules. And we can set this to be a deny role. This has nothing to do with the actual GIA implementation. It's, 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 ab it's abstraction that we need to, to put in place in order to uh, calculate our um, resulting set of GIA. And then we link them together. A print administrator get linked, gets linked to a print server role, a file administrator gets linked to a file server role and DFS uh, role, or whatever, whatever there uh, is that you put in place. And uh, we just say those GIA links can be excluded from a specific delivery model. And then we get the capability to pre-flight our GIA design because if at first we need to superpose all the machine roles that are linked to anywhere. And if the, there are contradictions within that, then our GIA design is not valid. We need to fix that. In the next step, we can evaluate of the, uh, if the user roles can translate to a, um, to a specific delivery model with these machine roles. And if everything checks out, we just uh, go ahead and configure those um, 
uh, those uh, script files and uh, role capability files and deploy them to the machine. Now I need to offer a word of apology. What I'll be showing now is basically a start of a work in progress. I did that for a very, uh, very security conscious uh, organization and they promised me that I will be allowed to show the actual live code. And one month ago, uh, they revoked that decision. So no code developed there uh, was allowed to leave, uh, leave, the, uh, leave the organization. So I started recreating what, uh, what we did there from memory. Didn't actually get as far as I hoped to. But I, I, I'll keep working on that. I invite everybody to participate. So uh, I expect the first release uh, on like the 30th of uh, July. So uh, watch, watch the GitHub repo as soon as uh, it becomes public. Everybody is uh, welcome to uh, check out, look at the code, look at, uh, at the tool and participate. What it basically looks like is this. So I'm a big fan of start demo scripts. Yeah, uh, we called it GIA cockpit because that, um, that's what uh, the business requirements folks uh, are usually most comfortable with. And um, yeah, you can have your dashboards. We have seven machines that have been inventoried. Two GIA users that are allowed to use uh, uh, GIA. 72 groups in this environment. It's a small AD. Uh, there's not uh, very much in there. But from those seven machines, we have harvested uh, 128 modules. You can explore those. Uh, see what uh, uh, what commandlets. Uh, oh, sorry, that doesn't expose any. Again, no, no not not uh, not a production code. Um, yeah, you, you you can. You, I I always uh, yeah, well take Active Directory. So there are those commandlets. Uh, you'll be able to further exp explore the parameters and so on. So you can manage your groups, JIT, in a limited way. Um, you'll be able to manage the uh, machines. These are the seven in, in terms of GIA. Those are the seven machines we had discovered. Some of them have PS version 5.1, others have 2.0. You would be seeing this here as well. So I have one machine having 2.0 and so on. Um, you, can, you can define your uh, CMD programs, uh, access, um, uh, access control, run as accounts, and uh, in the end, in the end, you can generate your current state of GIA. This stuff is not, not there yet. I was hoping to, to get it kind of running uh, until today, but it's, it, it's just too complex. And there are uh, approval workflows where someone who's missing a commandlet in her daily work within a constrained GIA endpoint, um, can request that she become access to that commandlet on that machine. And then the GIA master can review that and approve that, which will result in an override. Everybody who has worked with SCOM knows overrides are the daily business. And uh, this is kind of, uh, kind of the case here. 
you, you can define an override and uh, at the next year uh, deployment, it will become part of the configuration for that particular user on that particular machine or globally for that role or at multiple levels, right? So that's, uh, that's the framer framework that I, uh, currently, I'm currently working on. Bits and pieces do work, but not uh, the, whole, uh, the whole construction. So how, we d uh, how can we deploy that? Once we, uh, we've generated our uh, thousands of uh, text files and scripts, we can push those configurations. I mean, Gia Master will probably operate in God mode. You can de 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 describe a Gia endpoint for, for the daily management of Gia, but um, that's, uh, that's pretty hard. So you can copy role capabilities to the destination machines, copy the endpoint configuration files, and then register the PS remoting configuration. Uh, uh, there's a commandlet for that. That commandlet does not use remoting itself because uh, it will restart WinRAM. So you need to invoke that remotely. You need to run that locally, but you can run that in a remoting session, which will break uh, when, uh, when uh, the commandlet restarts WinRAM. But if that was the last commandlet in, uh, in, in the script, so uh, that's basically okay. <clears throat> it has a parameter, uh, no service restart. With which you kind of can push the configuration out to the machine, but uh, but not restart WinRAM unless uh, unless on uh, at uh, at a later time. But I would strongly discourage you from using that, at least if you try uh, to implement Gia in a manageable way, because the configuration will be registered. So if you you will have a discrepancy between the registered and the actual running configuration on that machine. So if you have monitoring or compliance checks in place, uh, I will try to show you how those go uh, in a minute. <clears throat> uh, then you uh, will get red flags, but you actually just try to be nice to your users and postpone the WinRM restart in order to not uh, disconnect their sessions. Um, you can use the uh, DSC resource that is maintained by the PowerShell team. It's an official official DSC resource for, for Gia that doesn't do anything else than copy uh, PSRC and PSSC files to their respective locations and then uh, register, register the uh, endpoint. Um, again, you need to have some control of when it happens, in order to not kick all the admins of the machine <clears throat> at a, a wrong point of time. Or you do what basically most big boys should be doing. You use your organization's configuration management like SCOM or Matrix or whatever, because in those scenarios you can push the files ahead of time and you can specify mostly the exact moment or conditions under which uh, they will register the endpoints and then restart WinRM, right? But WinRM restarts are a, an issue with these uh, GIA uh, operations. So how do we, how do we monitor uh, if, if our GIA actually is in compliance? There are two, two things to monitor, or there are two approaches to, to monitoring GIA. We could try comparing the running config to intent. Yeah, well, uh, you need to analyze what's running for which user, and uh, your intent needs to be equally well defined. If you, if you get it right, I couldn't, 
even uh, in production, then it works and yields, or oh, in theory, I haven't seen that uh, out there, but it would yield 100% reliable results. What you can do is comparing a running config to authored config. So you need to rely on your authoring, on your GR design, to export the configurations that are actually valid in terms of intent. And then you compare uh, the running configuration to that. Short demo. So, we're connecting to a machine. Um, can folks uh, back there uh, see, see, see the text? Shall I make it larger? Then parts will, will disappear. So we're connecting to a machine PSConf04 and look and looking at the non-standard GIA endpoints that may be there. So I have, I have four, four uh, endpoints there and GIA restricted is the one I wanted to look at and check if that conforms to intent. So that's, that's my end, my endpoint. And in the endpoint configuration, there is a property named config file path, which is awesome because, uh, this, um, this config file path <coughs> defines where the running configuration is stored. And it's in uh, PowerShell uh, v1.0, session config, geo restricted, etc. So it looks familiar. If we split that into parts, we see the name of the endpoint and a GUID. And this is the uh, configuration file that actually was used to dis, uh, deploy uh, that endpoint, and that's the good from that. So, we know which, files, which file was used, we know which file is running, we just compare them in terms of SHA-256 uh, hash, and the files are identical. So we know now that the intent has been transported correctly into production. And pretty much, pretty much in the same way, I can analyze role capability files because I created them. Of course, if I, if, if, if I detect role capability files that I have not created, it's, it's uh, also non-compliant. So I, I'll make a script log which just lists the role capabilities files to a given role name. And then we scroll through the endpoint and um, just look what. And nothing came back. What we have, uh, have done, we listed all role capability files that would uh, be uh, uh, contained in those paths and um, bear the name of role PSRC. And then we just look at how many we find. And ideally, we should be finding exactly one, which is the case here. And when we find it, we can compare it to the uh, intent, to the uh, generated role, in exactly the same fashion. So, that's pretty much uh, all what I wanted to show you today. To summarize, abstraction and automation, and uh, first and foremost, visual tools, will hopefully help us overcome the limitations of GIA adoption by the business users. The sum of all complexity remains the same in every business, uh, in every delivery model, but in 
like role-based delivery model, you can offload parts of that to the invoker. You can introduce deny into role superposition in that you make those abstraction and, uh, and correlation exclude the uh, unwanted commandlets or parameters. And uh, you need to, to run compliance checks on a regular basis to, co to combat configuration drift. So thank you very much. Are there any questions? No questions. Um, with the GS configuration, you're only um, saying which commands are allowed. So when is it useful to also say a deny? It's okay. The question uh, the question was in which scenario it's useful to have a deny in a GIA configuration. If you, if you have, in my experience, if you have multiple, multiple roles assigned to multiple users uh, through group memberships, they can drift. Or if you have two lenient role definitions because the guy who made them uh, uh, wasn't considering operations, but just like, uh, yeah, scripting, then you can have commandlets. That example is actually from the field. They had, they had that one server that runs calculations for like 40 days. And they ended up with a role which allowed restart computer. It wasn't intended to, but it just slipped in there. So this is, this is the scenario where I would put Restart computer on the deny list in the machine or in the machine role configuration to make sure nobody ever besides God and God is everybody who can connect to the default endpoint uh, uh, is allowed to restart that machine remotely. That, that's one example. Any other questions? Please. The question was, uh, is it possible to run scripts or uh, allow certain scripts to be run within a GIA configuration? Yes. I'm not 100% sure, but I think, I think they will have a uh, uh, need to have access to the... Uh, no? Okay, if, if you, if you defy, define your script as a function in your configuration, and you push that out with the endpoint, then they don't need the uh, individual commandlet. You can't say script c dot scripts uh, etc my awesome script dot ps1 is allowed to be run be okay but you can push out individual functions as many of them as you like and those can be run even if uh, the individual commandlets are not accessible in that configuration So the question was uh, that actually should be going to Paul. Um, how many work? How, uh, what amount of work would be required to uh, allow Gia for PowerShell Core? Gia is working with PowerShell Core in that same scenarios that are uh, possible with Windows PowerShell. So as long Gia is not a feature of PowerShell, Gia is a feature of WinRM. So. As long as you use WinRM remoting, you basically have good chances to get Jira. If you, uh, if you stray away from WinRM remoting, uh, that's not going to happen very soon, uh, as I gathered in, in Paul's session. Any more questions? So, thank you very much. Grab a coffee.
It would be awesome to welcome many of you back here for the second part.